So, A Touch of Evil and Dark Gothic are both inspired by the same intellectual property, but they're very different games. So it begs the question, why compare these two games? Are they really fighting for the same spot on a gamer's shelf? One being a relatively light deck builder, and by that I don't mean that there isn't some complexity to the gameplay, uh, but just that um, it doesn't have the same kind of sorting and setup that you may have with a Thunderstone or a Legendary or something like that. It's more in the vein of uh, Ascension or the Cryptozoic Cerebrus Engine deck builders like DC and Lord of the Rings uh, where you play off a center line and there's a few cards available at all times. Um, but it's relatively easy to kind of jump into. The rule set is pretty light. Um, and then A Touch of Evil is a full board game with miniatures and a map and bunch of different tokens and a track that you have to monitor and so um, you know they're two very different kinds of games but given the fact that they tell the same story depict the same world and given the divisive nature of flying frogs uh, art style in general I think that people may find themselves trying to choose between these two games maybe not willing to immediately take the plunge into both of them um, right off the bat if they're not initiated into the style. I know myself when I was first um, I was brought to Flying Frog via horror games because I was looking for a horror game and obviously A Touch of Evil was quite high on the list of you know games that kind of give you that real creepy sense that I like in, in horror. Um, but when I first saw the art style I, I, I balked a bit. I said is this something that um, I'm really into? I hadn't evaluated that for myself personally, is this something I like or, or not? So I said, you know, th that was before Dark Gothic had come out, or perhaps I may have entered in, in this way because it was a smaller investment just to kind of see how I felt. But I really bought into A Touch of Evil after watching the reviews and things like that because I saw the, the lengths that the publisher had gone to, and the designer of course, to um, create an immersive experience and that's really what I was looking for from a horror game I would imagine most people are it's a theme driven uh, motivation when you're looking for a game of this nature so um, I went with A Touch of Evil and I was very pleased with it and that actually inspired me to buy Dark Gothic which I think it was the intent um, and how it plays out for most people because they like the one and they want to continue to immerse themselves in the world in a different gameplay style particularly in a lighter gameplay style. Not that this is a very heavy game, it's a medium weight game I'd say, but this is something you just can throw to the table in a non-committal sort of way. Not that this couldn't take you a little while to play, it could. There are a lot of choices and some people may, you know, spend a little bit more time with those choices than others, so this game could last you a while. It's a meaty, solid game for a game of this style, but the style itself has a limitation as to, you know, how much is going to be involved with playing it. Um, so, in deciding between these two games, let's talk about them each individually. Okay, so first, let's take a look at A Touch of Evil. A Touch of Evil offers a lot in terms of theme, which presumably is what you're looking for, once again, um, when you get involved with something like this. Um, the, the map board, very specifically, is uh, a unique design, you know, uh, the, the way it looks like a antique map. Um, the mood that it creates is somewhat more imaginative. Um, it's not depicting everything in the slightest detail. That detail is going to be filled in with the card drawers. Each location has its own deck of cards, which is nice. It kind of um, allows them to make each place feel a little bit different. Um, and altogether, it kind of paints a picture of this town and what's going on at the time. Um, I think that the the components are excellent. Flying Frog has slightly different components than what you might be used to from a, a fantasy flight or something like that. Um, the cards are very glossy. They feel very thick when you first get them out. Um, but they really have a nice quality feel to them. Um, the board is small, but again has a quality feel and, and has a, um, an appealing um, artistic interpretation, I think. Um, the miniatures, they're high quality miniatures, they're excellent um, and you know they depict well the characters that are portrayed on the on the character cards. Mm. 
Um, also, the inclusion of the audio soundtrack, which, again, is another somewhat divisive factor for some reason. There are people who think, you know, that is, um, you know, a little bit corny or just unnecessary and may increase the price of the game unnecessarily because who needs it. I don't know how much it's increasing the price of the game. I mean, this game is priced right in line with other games of its size, so I don't really think that that's a consideration. Um, and what you get with that audio soundtrack shouldn't be overlooked. It's adding in another aspect of immersion to the game, which is all but wholly ignored in the industry. I mean, and it is something that is desired by a lot of people. There are websites dedicated to providing background music, ambient sounds to board gaming. Um, I think that anything you can do to kind of bolster that theme and create an experience is important. And, and this is something that nobody else is really doing. And, and I think that it's like a box of having a third arm. I mean, whatever this game offers in terms of design, in terms of art, you can compare with other games. But when it comes to that, the audio soundtrack, this is something that this game has that the other games just don't. So they get zero, and this game gets whatever it gets, depending on how well you like the soundtrack. But it's, it's bringing in a whole other resource for telling that story, and it shouldn't be overlooked. It's, it's actually a great soundtrack. Also, you know, music has a tendency to be um, a very profound aspect to our life experiences. Certain songs you may remember the first time you heard them if it was an important time in your life or maybe a period in your life when you were really enjoying that song and, and hearing that song again 10 years later, 20 years later really brings you back to that time and the mental space you were in and what was important to you and what wasn't and the people you were surrounded with and the things you used to do. So music can have a profound effect on, on our experiences and this soundtrack does just that. I mean, if I hear this soundtrack 10 years from now, it's going to bring me back to when I first got this game and how I felt and the immersion that, that happens as you explore a new thematic game like this. So I think it's a real bonus and it's, it's, uh, it's a selling point for this game. It's not something just to be tossed away lightly, in my estimation. Um, the game plays well. It's, um, you know, an adventure game as you move around trying to uh, investigate different areas and um, you try to train up and bolster your character get them stronger and then find the lair of the villain and um, eventually overcome him the other nice thing um, so often in these flying frog games is that you have a competitive or cooperative option obviously the two games play very similarly and with just a small tweak you can go one way or the other which is great because not everybody enjoys competitive games um, and some people want to um, have a little bit of that in a game or they just don't feel like like they're, they're playing in the style that they want to be playing. So this gives you that option. It, it, and so it speaks to a broad range of um, preferences, I think, in, in how you like to approach uh, a thematic adventure game. Um, the cooperative edition also makes it a great soloable game. Um, this game plays solo very well when handling multiple characters. It's not really an issue. If you solo, you're used to that. But even if you're kind of new to that, I think you can handle this pretty well. Um, uh, you know, what you have to manage is not overwhelming. Uh, overall, the game is great, and it's going to really tell the story of this world in the best possible way. Now, let's contrast that with Dark Gothic. Dark Gothic shares the theme of A Touch of Evil, but is necessarily limited, um, limited by the <coughs> style of the game. It being what I refer to as a light deck builder. Um, it's not able to kind of <clears throat> bring out the nuances of the story, to bring out the same level of exploration. Now, Obviously, a lot of that is dependent upon what the gamer brings to it, and th that's something that we don't really talk about enough. We judge games, we, we, we say this game is thematic, this game isn't, or you know the theme didn't come across, and of course there's a certain amount of de design implementation that can facilitate that thematic immersion. But what about what we're bringing to the table? You know, you can get a lot more out of a game like, uh, let's say, Legendary Marvel, um, 
by taking the time to put it in a thematic context. It doesn't just jump out at you necessarily. The theme is present in terms of the dressing <clears throat> of the game. But, you know, there are some inconsistencies if you're just going to focus on what the game is providing. If you kind of bring your own imagination to the table and say, well, well, here's what's happening. On my turn, you know, the, the, the Hulk is doing this and Captain America is doing that. And then on your turn, the Hulk is doing this and, you know, Spider-Man is doing that. So it's not that I'm one character or you're one character in that kind of game, but we can still tell a story if we're willing to kind of use our imagination a little bit. Um... So there are those limitations in this style of game that can be overcome with your own input. But Dark Gothic has done everything it possibly can within the scope of its game to provide you with that thematic potential. Um, one of the big things that it provides is the character cards. This is something that's lacking in a lot of deck builders, um, like a Thunderstone, although I know they had the promo avatar cards, which, you know, very, very lightly give each player a slightly different focus, but <clears throat> um, something like, um, you know, the legendary Marvel game, you don't have a specific character that you're playing, so you don't really feel like anyone in particular, and that's why it's necessary to kind of just tell the story through the game for yourself. Especially for solo play, I find this to be a big consideration. If I'm playing two different characters in a competitive way, or even in a cooperative way, um, it facilitates the experience to have them be differentiated somehow. Because uh, part of solo gaming is kind of getting your mind into different perspectives. Especially if you're playing competitively against yourself. You know, you might be able to say, hey, this character is very thoughtful and very cunning but not necessarily very aggressive. So I'm going to buy these kind of cards, or I'm going to play this kind of a style, whereas this character is just a beast thumping his chest and charging into a group of goblins or whatever, and I'm going to play according to that style. That helps you kind of separate your thought process a little bit. And even when you're playing with other people, it's fun to kind of have your own persona in the game, not to just be very generic. Like in something like Star Trek, the deck building game, where... You know, you, I like that game very much, and it's a great way to um, embrace that theme in a tabletop format. But your character is, is generic, so is the other player, and you're both drawing from the same pool of cards. So, what's to really separate you from each other or to distinguish you? Now, something like a High Command, um, or even a Rune Age, where you have your own cards that you're pulling from, really helps in that regard, but uh, this game does not have its own pool of cards for each player, but it does have character cards which outline a different starting deck for each player, similar to something like Shadow on Crossfire, where this character is going to have this many combat cards, and this many cunning cards, and this many spirit cards, and this character is going to have different values for those and have a slightly different focus. Now, these are just resources in the game, so it's going to affect the kind of cards that you can buy and the kind of minions that you can overcome. Um, but then there is the balancing aspect of honor, which is a fourth wild resource that could be used for any of the other resources. Um, I like that mechanism because not only does it give you options, even from early on in the game, um, but I like the way it plays out differently based on whether you're playing a card from your hand or if a card is out on the table. If a card is out on the table and has an honor quantity, that can be paid with anything that you have in your hand, but it has to be paid in one suit, let's say, in one resource. So if it has a five honor requirement, you have to have five combat or five cunning. You can't have two combat and three cunning. It has to be all one. So that's the way it works as you're going in. And then once you have honor cards in your hand, um, spending honor is just used as a wild. You can spend it in any way you want. It can be, if it's two honor, it can be two combat. Um, but if you have multiple cards with honor, they could each be something different, and you can have some versatility in that way. In addition, you have this cards off to the side of the board that allow you to train, um, to build more cunning into your deck, more spirit into your deck, to either balance you out or to help you really excel in whatever it is that you're already good at. Um, so those options are always available. There's also the standing minion card, which can be... Um, overcome much like uh, in Ascension and when you overcome it it'll allow you to destroy a card from the center line um, or a card that you played from your hand so it's a way of kind of uh, 
you know, streamlining your deck and getting rid of less potent cards, as is common in a deck builder, but also to destroy something from the center line, which comes up sometimes, especially in uh, the cooperative game, where some of the, the minions um, on a die roll may go into um, the shadow area for the villain. And when that area gets to 10 cards, you lose the game cooperatively. So you don't want cards going there, so you have to des destroy the minions. But some of those minions, when played from your hand, have a strike ability, which affects all the players and is generally negative. So you have to get that card out of the center line, but you don't really want to bring it into your hand because if you played it, it would hurt everybody. So then you'd have to waste a uh, another ability that lets you destroy that card later on or whatever, you know. Um, plus, there's the victory points to consider. You, you really would want to keep that card if you could, but it's not very playable. But to just eliminate a minion without having to bring it into your hand can be useful at times. So there's that standing minion that you could always go to. gives you another option. So the game is definitely filled with choices. Um, and one of the other things that it brings that's somewhat unique is the omen die. I really like the addition of the omen die. I like the die itself. I like just having that die in my collection. It's really nice. But the way it's implemented is, is interesting as well. It does have its own thing going on. It's not just a gimmick. Uh, of course, it, it just generates random results, but you may have a, a card with a global effect out on the table that says when you roll a skull on the omen die, discard a card. Um, and then you may have an ability from your hand that says, you know, roll the omen die and, uh, you know, whatever number is depicted gain that much combat, let's say. So you want to roll the die to get the combat, but you have that global effect to consider too. If, if you land on a skull, it's going to make you discard. So there's a consideration there. And a lot of the different cards can kind of play off each other in terms of the omen die. So it does bring in another aspect to the game and another tactile feel as well. As you're playing a card game, you get to roll a die every now and then. Something that I, I enjoy about Pathfinder is that the adventure card game is that interplay between the dice and the cards and going back and forth. It's another dimension to it. Um... You know, you're going to have three villains that you have to fight in progression, much like something like Lord of the Rings deck builder, uh, where you're working down the pile, and each one is harder to defeat. They may have global effects, they have fight effects. When you do engage the villain, something's going to happen. So you have to consider that as well, although generally it's nothing too terrible. Um, the game is challenging, uh, not overly so, and not all the time. Uh, sometimes, you know, you may just kind of win the game easily, other times things can gang up on you. That's just the nature of the beast when it comes to uh, randomization. Um, now, I understand that the expansion for this um, does kind of add another level of challenge to it. Uh, so if you do enjoy the game, there is that option. Colonial Horror is the expansion for this game, and it's, it's you know, going to fit in this box. It's also a standalone game on its own, so you could go that route if you wanted to. Um, but overall, I think that this game does everything it can to bring the theme across. It shares an art style with a touch of evil. So we've talked about the art style a lot. Let's look at some of the cards. We'll look at the cards from Dark Gothic. There's similar art in both games, sometimes repetitive art in both games. Um, and uh, I think that you'll get a sense for whether or not you can get involved in this via the cards. We're looking at them from Dark Gothic because here it's so important. The art is the driving force behind the theme. The, me the mechanisms are there and they support that theme, but the art is going to take a lot of the load because it can't do what a touch of evil can do in terms of telling the story. So, here you go. So what's the final considerations if you're trying to choose between these two games? 
maybe you say, well, you know what, some of that looks kind of cool. I may be able to get into it. I'm not willing to like, you know, dive in head first. I just want to try one of these games, see how I feel about it. This is the lower price point. Maybe that's a good place to start. Well, that depends on um, how much theme you're looking for relative to the weight of the game. In other words, uh, where's the space in your collection right now? What are you looking to play? If you're looking to play something a little bit lighter, then this would be a way to, to get involved initially. But understand that you're giving up something in terms of theme. This game created the world. This one tells you who everybody is, tells the story of what's going on. This is a reflection of that. It's a spin-off of that. So you do lose something, I feel, by coming in here never having played A Touch of Evil. You lose a little bit just because the world isn't fleshed out. You see these cards, you don't know who these people are. You'll get some names and, and maybe an idea for them through the cards a little bit, but it's not going to really stick with you. It'll be something extremely, uh, you know, momentous. Uh, if you've played A Touch of Evil before, you're familiar with them, and so you come in with a richness that's just not available if that's the first game that you bought. So understand that you're giving something up thematically. The, the bonus would be that it's the kind of game you're looking for right now. If, if, if you're looking for a light deck builder, something you can get to the table relatively easily, something that people who have played deck building games before are going to understand readily, uh, there will be very little rule overview w with a game like this if you've played other deck builders of this style. Um, so that's a, that's a major consideration, and so you'd go with Dark Gothic in that case. All things being equal, A Touch of Evil is where I would start. If you can, um, you know, put in the, the time of setup, which is not exorbitant, it's just going to be more so than with something like this. Um, and if you have a crew that, that, you know, will play a full board game, or if you're going to solo the game and you're willing to kind of go through all of that, then I would go in this direction because it's going to flesh out the theme um, in a much deeper way. Um, there is something to talk about. You know, I've heard people say about A Touch of Evil uh, that it has a roll and move mechanism as though that's inappropriately administered and that it shouldn't be there. I, I think there needs to be a distinction between roll and move in the sense that you roll a die and must move that number of spaces and roll and move in terms of roll a die and you can move up to that number of spaces. Those are two drastically different mechanisms in my estimation. The former being outmoded. That's understood. I mean, understood. We know that, you know, those old games like Clue or whatever where you had to roll the precise number to get into a certain space becomes incredibly awkward. And I think that a lot of times in those games there just wasn't that depth of challenge, so they had to create challenge in that contrived, trivial way. Um, this game, you roll a die and can move up to that number of spaces. I don't have a problem with that. I, I think that it's thematic. I think that um, if you can accept randomness, which uh, presumably you can if you're willing to enter into the game space that A Touch of Evil resides within. Um, you're going for a thematic game like this, typically there will be some randomness uh, to add that surprise element um, in the storytelling. But you know, a guy is walking through the woods and maybe he cut his leg on some bramble and he has to tend to it. Or maybe uh, as he's walking on the road, somebody stops him, he gets caught up. Or the weather and other natural uh, environmental effects kind of slowed him down that day. And he just didn't get as far as he thought he would. So you roll a three on the die. I wanted to move six. I thought I'd make it today, but it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to. But I could still work within my three and... You know, do I want to go here or do I want to go there? I get some choice in it. Or I could just try and travel as far as I can that day and then, you know, try again tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, although it may be unbalanced and you say, well, how one guy can move more than another, stuff comes up, right? So it's not really an issue thematically for me. And I don't think it's, it's something that um, is a detriment to the game in any way. Um, in terms of the cooperative and competitive play, um, again, it's a little bit of a race to the finish uh, in the competitive game because the first one to defeat the villain is going to win the game. So you have to balance how fast can I get there, but I definitely want to be ready. I don't want to kind of blow my resources and, and, and make a, you know, a failed attempt or even get you know, myself killed. And then you, know, you have all the things associated with that to get yourself up and running again. You know, so um, I think that the game plays out well under the circumstances it provides, competitive or cooperative, it definitely tells the story in a deeper, richer way, and that's the direction that I would go to 
if I had to choose one to get involved with. Both work well together and there's space for both in your collection undoubtedly. Particularly if you like the world, you definitely would be well served by going out to get this. So you can play it on a night when you're a little tired, you don't feel like all the setup, maybe you don't have the time commitment available, you know, you can just dive in quickly and get the flavor. Um, or with gamers who, you know, maybe wouldn't be able to handle something just a little bit heavier. Again, this game is not extremely heavy, but it depends on who you're playing with, that's a relative term, you know. So, there's room for both in your collection, as you can see, I own both. I very much enjoy having this for just that very reason, especially since I solo a lot. Sometimes I don't want to get involved in all of this, or I played another game that night, now I just want to kind of jump in and do some light deck building. So there's room for both in your collection, but if you have to start, start here, unless you're really concerned primarily with the weight of the game being lower. Um, that's about it for these two games. You can't go wrong. Thanks for checking in. I'll talk to you soon.